far. So for the next half an hour on my Instagram Live, I thought I would talk about how to get the best out of your appointment and also how to be your own advocate. Every day I listen to stories of women all over the world who are really struggling to be listened to, to receive the treatment that they want and sometimes the treatment that they ask for. I can't think of any other area in medicine where it's so difficult to receive treatment that comes from evidence. So I do understand because many of you might know that I take HRT, I also take testosterone, I also use a vaginal hormone preparation called prasterone and I know that I can't get the dose and type of HRT that I'm on from my own NHS GP. Now I'm a white, middle class, educated, English speaking doctor. So if it's hard for me to receive treatment, then it can be really hard for many others who aren't as fortunate as me to receive treatment that they deserve. But it's difficult and I understand it's difficult. I have a lot of insight and I often wonder what the barriers are and there are lots of barriers. And actually for a lot of it is due to suboptimal education. A lot of doctors have grown up, like I did actually, not having any formal education about menopause or perimenopause. Often it's thought of as a gynaecological problem because people talk about menopause as being related to our period stopping or our ovaries failing. But actually, as many of you know, it's a multi-system disorder. Menopause occurs because our hormone levels decline and those three hormones, estradiol, progesterone and testosterone, affect every single cell in our body. And they're not just produced by our ovaries, as many of you know. They're also produced by our adrenal glands, from our brains and other tissues of our body. So I feel it shouldn't be a gynaecological problem. Yes, it can cause problems with our gynaecological organs in that in the perimenopause we can have heavy periods or painful periods, we can have cystitis and urinary symptoms, but the vast majority of us actually have symptoms that are affecting our brain, so low mood, memory problems, fatigue, but also other physical symptoms such as joint pain, muscle stiffness, palpitations. Gynaecologists aren't really best suited for that because that's not actually part of their training. Their training is to look after diseases of the gynaecological organs and the gynaecological or the, um, the urogenital tract, really. So we need to be thinking more as healthcare professionals. What are we doing to help women as much as possible? And some of it is education, but also for many years as women, we haven't been given the right information. If you Google menopause, it's always hot flushes, sweats. If you Google menopausal woman and look for a picture, it's always a white haired elderly or middle aged woman with a fan looking a bit distressed. We don't see the young women. We don't see women from different ethnicities who will also be menopausal or perimenopausal. So there's so much confusion. And a lot of my work is trying to um, reduce that confusion and um, education and knowledge is power. Once we have the right information, then we can often um, it really helps us to be listened to and get the right um, advice and treatment that we want. So I do know it's a struggle and you only need to look at the statistics to know what a struggle it is because we have guidelines and we have evidence and we know that for the majority of women, first line treatment is replacing the missing hormones. And we know that if women take HRT at the right dose and type for them, symptoms improve because obviously we're treating the underlying cause, we're replacing the missing hormones. But more importantly, when we look at global health, we are actually improving the global health of women because we're reducing disease risk and disease burden. And these diseases are very prevalent. So heart disease, osteoporosis, diabetes, dementia, clinical depression, all inflammatory diseases and actually earlier death. So women who um, take HRT live longer as well. It's a choice whether we take HRT or not. Everything we do in life is a choice. But actually, if that choice is taken away from us, then it's very difficult um, to know what to do, really. So we know the guidelines show the majority of women would benefit from HRT, as does the evidence. Yet in the UK, about 14% of menopausal women are prescribed HRT, and globally it's about 5%. Now, I'm not a mathematician, but 5% is not the majority. Now, some women won't want to take HRT. Some women, um, it's, not a, it's not something that they're thinking about. But actually, 
even if you just look at this, the thousands of women I've spoken to and listened to and corresponded with over the last eight years, those women are not receiving the treatment that they want. So what do we do if we're faced with um, a difficulty trying to be heard or being told that we can't have it? We know that antidepressant prescribing has really increased and that's increased in conjunction with actually HRT prescribing reducing. And we know about a third of women on average are offered or prescribed antidepressants instead of HRT. So I think the most important thing to do as a perimenopausal or menopausal woman or someone with PMS, PMDD, is getting the information and trying to make the diagnosis yourself. And one of the reasons I developed the free balance app is that you can download it and monitor your symptoms and if you're having periods track those as well so then it gives you a bit of time for internalization and reflection and think could any of my symptoms be related to my hormonal changes and certainly if you're getting symptoms which are coming on just before your periods or that feeling that you had before your periods is now extending throughout the other days of the month and you think you feel it might be related to your hormones you're probably right so on the Balance app, you can um, do a, um, a symptom checker and you can create a health report. Now, I designed that because then with this health report, if you're monitoring periods, that will come out too, but it will have the symptoms and it will be a list. Many of you will have seen it and it will say whether the symptoms you don't have them or they're mild, moderate or severe. And that's really useful. So I would certainly use that to take with you or email it in advance to your healthcare provider. Because actually, especially as a GP, you've got 10 minutes. And often in consultations, people say, one problem, one consultation. So if you have a myriad of symptoms, like many of us do, would it be your headaches or your joint pains or your palpitations or your low mood or your urinary symptoms? Which problem would you go to? Whereas if you've got the symptom questionnaire, this health report, you can go with that, with a myriad of symptoms on. And actually what I often recommend is people just going to their doctor, nurse, pharmacist, their healthcare professional and saying, I've worked out myself. I think that I'm perimenopausal or menopausal. And I would like to talk to you about treatment choices and these are my symptoms. Those words take about seven or eight seconds. And then you've got nearly a whole 10 minutes to discuss treatment choices, which you will have um, worked out and understood and, and read about before you go to the consultation. And that actually can be really, really useful for you as a patient, but also for us as healthcare professionals, because actually to ask all the questions, you know, do you have joint pains? Do you have headaches? How's your mood? Actually takes quite a long time in a short consultation. So if someone's got it all there, and if I see quite quickly that the severe symptoms are the ones maybe affecting their mood or vaginal dryness or urinary symptoms, then I know I can focus on those more as well. And actually, sometimes it unmasks symptoms. Um, we're only human as healthcare professionals. We might forget to ask a relevant question. And so if someone comes, and I think I've done a really good consultation, and maybe I've forgotten to ask them about joint pains, and then it materialises that they can't get out of bed in the morning because they're riddled with joint pain, but they didn't think it important to tell me in the consultation, then I'm not going to know. So the more we have in advance, the better or at the beginning of the consultation. So that health report can be really useful. So I would certainly fill that out before going to your consultation. The other thing that's useful is having information. Now we have to be really careful where we get information from. As many of you know, I've worked as a medical writer for 25 years. I've written books about evidence-based medicine and I've worked very hard over the last 25 years working for all sorts of organisations, including the Royal College of General Practitioners, um, uh, actually um, sort of unpicking evidence, looking at complicated um, papers, looking at guidelines and summarising them for busy GPs, but also for um, lay public as well. So that's something I've worked on and I've had a lot of training in that over the last 25 years. So all the information that we write on Balance, on our balance-menopause.com website, on my Instagram, 
in my podcast is based on evidence. It's based on fact. Some people don't like what I say, but it's not me that's making it up. I am literally just regurgitating evidence based on some good science. We don't have loads of evidence, as many of you know, about HRT because the studies haven't been done. But we've got a huge amount of knowledge about the basic physiology of hormones, which I've spoken about on podcasts and Instagram lives before. So I won't go through all that again. But actually, making sure that you've got a good evidence source. So many websites that I go to, um, actually, you have to be careful, firstly, who's written them and what conflicts they have. And that's really important. Um, my, um, just for declarations, really, I don't do any paid work with any pharmaceutical companies, neither does anyone in my organisation. It's really important. When I opened Newson Health uh, five years ago, I made the conscious decision not to do any paid work with any pharmaceutical companies. And I don't work with any products that endorse any menopause-related um, products uh, at all. And that's really important. So then um, my work is not biased in any way. So make sure you, you know what you're reading and then that it's accurate. And it's also relevant for you because so many times I read about um, risks or, or, or types of hormones or something and it's more related to someone in their 50s. Whereas if I was in my 30s with premature ovarian insufficiency POI, then it's not relevant. Or if I've had a hysterectomy, then some conversations aren't as relevant um, about, um, I don't know, using a coil, for example, than if I had a womb. So we just have to be careful what we read. And then um, if you've decided that you want to take HRT and it's difficult to get HRT, then certainly it should be a more easy con conversation because we have good guidelines saying about HRT being first line treatment for the, ma for the majority of women. It's difficult in some ways because the guidelines still refer to menopause um, symptoms as being basomotor symptoms, flashes, sweats. They do mention low mood and they mention vaginal dryness, but actually they don't mention many other symptoms, which is a real shame. Some of them do mention joint pains, but actually we have to remember that common sense is really important as well. The other thing about guidelines is they are what they say they are, they help guide. So there are different types of guidelines and there are different types of authors and different types of evidence that's used. Often in the UK, we use the NICE guidance, um, which are sort of government endorsed guidelines, which are very useful. But the NICE menopause guidance that we work out of are now eight years old. And so obviously there's been more advances, thankfully, um, with more evidence actually showing more about the safety of body identical hormones than for eight years ago. Other bodies produce guidelines. Um, some of these bodies don't go through this, the right, same rigorous processes as NICE do. Um, so again, you just have to be really careful looking who what the authors are. But guidelines are a guide, we're all different. Um, and often we don't all fulfill the right criteria for guidelines. And the other thing is in medicine, if we work people through the guidelines and they're still experiencing symptoms, then individualization is really important. The other thing that the NICE guidelines are very clear about, which will be in every um, NICE menopause guideline, I'm sure in the future, is talking about individualization of care. And that's really important, regardless of whether it's menopause or diabetes or raised blood pressure or migraine management, individualization is really important. And the other guidelines that are essential for me as a healthcare professional or you as a patient is the shared decision-making guidelines, which NICE have also produced as well. That's really, really important when there's ever a debate in anything in medicine and a doctor's saying no and you're wanting something or there's a bit of um, a disagreement, then the shared decision-making guidelines are really important because they basically say that any decision that we make about treatment, patients have to be involved. And if we have differing views, we have to respect and understand the patient might want to have something that is, is different to what we're advising. But as long as the patient, especially when they're a consenting adult, is aware of this difference in opinion and aware that there might be more risks than benefits, but they're prepared to undertake those, then actually they can still have treatment. And that's also about informed consent as well. And that's really important in this conversation. As a doctor, I feel very strongly that I'm actually patient's advocate. 
I'm not here telling people what they can and can't do. I can advise people, I can listen to them, I can talk to them about potential benefits and potential risks, but also uncertainties as well. There's a lot in medicine we don't know, and there's a lot we still don't understand, and there's a lot we still don't have evidence for. But actually, we can't always wait for the evidence, because if we've got a patient in front of us suffering, we as physicians will do what's best for them as an individual. And that's really important actually. So finding a doctor or nurse or pharmacist or healthcare professional that understands is crucially important. Before you book the appointment, it might be worth asking the receptionist, is there someone in the surgery that really has a lot of experience in perimenopause or menopause? Because what you don't want to do is waste someone's time or your time as well, your time is precious. So you don't want to be speaking to someone who's just going to say, no, or sorry, I don't understand. Um, and it might take a couple of consultations before you find someone, but I would certainly ask in advance if there's someone who understands. Now, if you are given hormones, and that's what you want, then there are different doses and there are different types. We tend, as many of you know, to give the body identical hormones, so the estrogen through the skin as a patch or gel, and the progesterone, usually the natural body identical progesterone as a oral capsule, it can be given off license vaginally, or the marina coil, and I spoke a lot about progesterone last week. And then also there's testosterone as well, which many women find that they benefit from. In addition to systemic hormones, there's vaginal hormones. Uh, classically, there's only ever been vaginal estrogen, which is because different preparations. But more recently, over the last three years or so, we've had intrarosa, which is called prasterone, which is DHEA, which converts to estrogen and testosterone. So daily pessarine can be very, very useful for people with localized symptoms. And the pessaries can be used alone or they can be used in conjunction with HRT. Now, one of the things that many people might not know is that every GP has what's called a formulary. So there's the, the uh, British Menopause Society, uh, sorry, the, I'll say that again, there's the British National Formulary, the BNF, which is like our Bible, if you like, of all the drugs in the UK that we can prescribe. But what's really frustrating is, is that in, in general practice, you're constrained by your local formulary. So when I was working as a GP, I wasn't allowed to prescribe Uchigestan, which many of you know is the only body identical progesterone. Um, well, it was at the time, there's another company that's making one now, but at the time it was the only body identical progesterone. And when I typed on my computer, it would come up with a sort of black box and sort of greyed out really. So I couldn't choose it on my list. I had to choose the synthetic progesterones first. And I actually know the evidence and I know that actually micronized progesterone, the natural body identical progesterone is safer. So I um, overrode the computer and prescribed people the uh, Nutrigestan. Now I knew I wouldn't get into trouble with it because I'm an independent prescriber. I've got GMC registration. I know what I'm doing is best for women. So that was fine, I was allowed to do it, but a lot of other doctors, if they haven't had training, won't be so comfortable, or actually they will get told off for doing it because of the, the way that GPs work locally in different regions. And this is actually also very relevant for testosterone. So I've spoken to a lot of GPs recently who tell me they're absolutely forbidden to prescribe testosterone, which I find really distressing because testosterone is probably one of the safest medications I've ever prescribed as a doctor. We use a very low dose, we monitor women, we hardly ever see side effects. And actually, for some women, it can be transformational for their mood, their energy, their concentration, their mental health. And so these GPs have to refer people to a gynecologist that gynaecologist may or may not have training in testosterone and may or may not agree to prescribe it. But the worst thing is, is there's often a long wait for gynaecological um, appointments. And I spoke to someone recently who'd waited nearly two years for an appointment to see a gynaecologist and the week before it was cancelled. I spoke to someone else recently who'd waited a year for an appointment. She went to see the gynaecologist who said, no, I don't think testosterone is going to help you. I'm too worried about side effects. I won't give it to you. And then where does that leave you as a woman? It's really difficult. We know that the nice guidance about testosterone are clear that if a woman is taking HRT and she has reduced sexual desire despite taking HRT, then testosterone can be considered. 
So actually, I don't see that as a doctor, I can refuse it if someone has reduced sexual desire. It's quite barbaric. I've mentioned it before that women are just think thought about as testosterone can only help their sexual desire. We know we have receptors for testosterone all over our brains and all over our bodies, and it's actually very safe. Um, most of us will have reduced sexual desire at some point as well anyway, but actually it, I think it's very hard as a doctor to refuse something that's in the guidelines. We have to have really good reason to do so. And so I think if you are refused, it is worth asking for the reasons for it to be refused and um, try and work out with that, that um, doctor is it a personal reason that they don't, they either haven't been educated or they don't, um, they're worried about side effects or they're not allowed to? Because those things are quite different because if they haven't been educated, then they can get training. Obviously we've done our Confidence in Menopause course, which is an online programme. And actually I've made a lecture about testosterone free, so anyone can access it freely available. Um, it can be accessed through my drlouisenewson.co.uk website. You just go into education and you can link it. Um, you can click on the link and, and watch about testosterone prescribing for free. Um, but also if they um, aren't allowed to, then that is a real problem. And that might be something that you want to um, take further locally um, with any authorities to see if they can change because things do change all the time. And often in medicine, people don't think about changing unless they hear from people. Um, so we've all got voices as patients. So it might be something that you want to work with others to try and change locally if GPs aren't allowed to prescribe um, testosterone. And it does seem a waste of gynecologists time to have to see people just to say, yes, you can have testosterone when they should be um, seeing people with gynecological disorders as well. Um, there are very few contraindications for HRT, for body identical hormones. So some people are told they can't have it because they have migraines or they've had a clot in the past or they've got endometriosis or polycystic ovarian syndrome or they're too young or they're overweight or they've had raised blood pressure or they've had a stroke before or they've had a heart attack before. All those that I've just con that I've just listed, you can have body identical hormones if you've had that in the past, because we know estrogen through the skin is just absorbed straight into the bloodstream, and the natural progesterone and the testosterone as well are just natural hormones. And actually, there is no reason why you can't have them. A lot of the contraindications are for people who want to um, prescribe the tablet estrogen and the synthetic progestogens. And so a lot of contraindications for contraception, for example, are not the same as contraindications for the natural body identical hormones. So again, that's why where doing your homework can be useful. We've written, for example, um, a booklet about clot risk and hormones on the Balance Hypermenopause website. And the same booklet is on the Thrombosis UK website because I've worked closely with Thrombosis UK to write that. And we've put references in it. So anyone who reads it can be reassured by looking at the academic references and being reassured that actually HRT is safe for women who've had a clot in the past. And they might want to share that to their healthcare pro professional um, and say, look, the, the evidence is here. Perhaps you could read it and maybe we can have another conversation to um, talk about being able to get HRT. Um, there is, and quite a few of you, thanks for your questions, have asked about um, uh, what about if you need a different dose. Now, the dosing of HRT can vary. We're all different. And actually what we're finding is the dosing of patches or gels can really vary between different people. Our skin is a barrier. It's not made to have chemicals and, and drugs going through it. So when I use sun cream or moisturizer, I hope it doesn't go into my bloodstream. But when, when I um, apply my patch, then I do want it to go through my skin into my bloodstream. But skin type is different. My skin is actually, um, doesn't absorb the patches very well. The patches don't really stick on very well. Sometimes I get very red and inflamed on the skin when I use my patches. And when I started HRT eight years ago, I found it didn't really help, it didn't do anything. My consultant measured my estrogen level, my estradiol level, and it was low. So he prescribed a, a higher than the, uh, like an off-label dose, if you like. He prescribed me 200 micrograms of patches. And then I absorbed it better. 
and um, it, it really worked for me. And so um, there isn't anything to say we're not allowed to prescribe an off-label um, dose. Some people um, are concerned about it and some GPs actually won't do it. And that's often because they feel that they're not experienced, in which case you would have to see a menopause specialist who does understand the basic pharmacology of um, a higher dose going through the skin doesn't always mean a higher level in the blood. It's just using the skin as a vehicle to get through. And some people, even though they might change from patch to gel or from gel to patches of an equivalent dose, they still might need a higher dose. And we do that in lots of other way, areas of medicine. If someone's in pain, we might give a higher dose of something. If someone's still got an underactive thyroid gland and they're on a standard dose of thyroxine, we increase the dose. If someone's got type 1 diabetes and they're on a standard dose of insulin, we increase the dose of insulin. People seem to get scared about oestrogen. There is no evidence that having a higher blood level of oestradiol or a higher dose of oestradiol causes any problems at all. And actually, if the dose isn't adequate for that person and their oestradiol level is low, it will still increase inflammation in the body. So we have to be thinking about what are the risks of not having the right dose for you. But if your doctor or, or, or prescriber isn't prescribing, then I would certainly go and see someone else. Um, Having progesterone after a hysterectomy or if you've got a marina coil in can still be beneficial and I spoke about that at length um, last week as well. So um, that's sort of covered really dosing, that's covered even starting HRT, also the um, testosterone, the problems that some doctors genuinely have that they're not allowed to prescribe testosterone. And that's the same actually for vaginal products. Um, some doctors still think that you can't have vaginal hormones with systemic hormones and about a fifth of women need both. So absolutely, that's fine. Um, some people actually aren't on their formulary can't, can't prescribe Interosa, which is this daily pessary of DHEA, which converts to estrogen and testosterone. I put a map on my grid recently of all the areas that can't have it, which is just awful because in my clinical experience, actually it can really help with urinary symptoms and rec recurrent urinary tract infections when vaginal hormones haven't worked. And increasingly in my clinical practice, I use it first line with some really, really good effects. Um, the other thing is, um, someone asked me, and she seemed a bit annoyed because I hadn't answered before, but I honestly get so many DMs and messages and comments, it's hard to keep up, about iron absorption and what about iron. So I am going to just mention this as well. Lots of people we see have low iron, and it's often blamed for them having heavy periods or not having enough iron in their diet. Now, oestrogen, progesterone and testosterone are actually important and they work to help iron absorption. So often balancing the hormones can improve ferritin and iron levels, but also thinking about nutritional sources for iron and also iron supplements, um, especially um, having adequate doses of, of, of iron and often should be taken with vitamin C, which helps the absorption. Um, so just, just to mention that as well. A few people, especially I met some people at a conference on Friday that I was lecturing at and a few people have messaged me saying, I don't have any symptoms at all and my GP won't give them to me because I'm not having symptoms, but I'm keen to consider HRT for disease prevention. Now there is good quality evidence that taking it, women taking HRT have a lower risk of heart disease and osteoporosis, increasing the evidence that there's a lower risk of type 2 diabetes, clinical depression, schizophrenia, neurodegenerative diseases, including um, dementia, but also Parkinson's and also autoimmune diseases if people take hormones. But the guidelines say there isn't enough evidence. It doesn't really make sense. And I think it's partly about trying to reduce HRT prescribing. Um, again, this goes back to shared decision making. If you feel you would like to try something to see if it, um, if it helps and doesn't cause any problems or side effects, then it is in with your rights as a patient to consider as long as it's a safe treatment. And as I've said, HRT is safe for the majority of women. 
There are many women actually who say they have no symptoms, but then when I say to them, what's your sleep like? And do you get any muscle joint pains? Do you get any cystitis? Do you get any mood changes? They'll often say, yes, but I think that's just part of getting older. But when they take HRT, they often feel that they sleep a lot better, that their motivation's better, that their memory's better, that their joint pain has reduced. So it's very hard to actually find a perimenopausal or menopausal woman who has no symptoms whatsoever. I'm sure there will be people, but actually, um, so so giving HRT to women, um, often it, we do what's called a therapeutic trial. We do it a lot in medicine. We try something and see if it helps the patient. If it helps, we continue. If it doesn't help, we change the dose or the formulation or try something completely different. And so with HRT, it's usually trying it for three months and then seeing does that person need a different dose or a different type or a different formulation. Um, and that's fine in medicine. It's just people have seemed so scared about hormones. It's really important that we think about them more because they really do make a difference to a lot of women and also reduce the risk of diseases and enable us to function better so we can then look at our nutrition and our lifestyle as well. So it's a combination of things. And it's really important when you find a healthcare practitioner who helps you that they look at everything in conjunction. So they're not just looking at um, which medication to prescribe you or looking and lecturing you about your nutrition and exercise. It's really important to look at everything together. Um, many people also, when they're taking hormones, can consider looking at what other medication they're taking and whether that can change as they start to feel better. And that needs to be done in conjunction with a prescriber as well. I've already said before, many people actually, when they're on HRT, find that they don't need to be on as many painkillers. Um, their mood might be better and they might be able to gradually reduce their antidepressants. Um, but again, that needs to be done in conjunction with someone who understands. Um, so I hope that's been helpful. There are so many problems with perimenopause and menopause care and I've been working quite hard for many years on this and sometimes I think it's getting better but a lot of the time I think it's actually getting worse because certainly a lot of my work and other people's work has enabled people to have more knowledge and understanding about their hormones but what that has meant is that quite a few women still get a lot of pushback and a lot of negativity and I find that really sad. It's 2024. There's a lot we need to change, but I think we need to work together. We need to be more advocates for ourselves, but also it's not just for ourselves. It's for maybe our friends, our colleagues, our, our, um, our family members. So if someone's struggling and they're telling you that they're not getting help, maybe go with them to their next appointment. Maybe help them, maybe write some notes beforehand and really, or maybe write to the doctor in advance to say, this is what I'd like to get out of my consultation. This is what's worrying me or I'm not feeling listened to. Is it possible to um, just listen and let me, you know, let me, let me explain to you so you can understand why I would like this treatment or why I wouldn't like that treatment if they're, you're being offered antidepressants and you feel you don't need them, for example. So there's lots to think about. Obviously, my work through Balance app, through the website, through my book, through my podcast, there's lots of ways of getting information that is hopefully right for you. So I hope that's been useful. Thanks for your support. Thanks for all your questions. Um, have a great week and I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you so much.